Where does the money from the Fed come from? Where does it go? What's the impact? This is in the overnight markets, the so-called repo markets, and everything else. Richard Wolf breaks it all down for us. Check it out. Leave your comments. Ding the bell. Share it with your friends and subscribe to our channel. And welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. And on the line with us is Professor Richard Wolf, the uh, co-founder of, of uh, Democracy, excuse me, of where, where did this go? Here it is. Uh, Democracy at Work. <laughs> Democracy right. at Work info. Thank you. At rdwolf.com with two Fs is his other website. To, and you can tweet him at Prof Wolf or Democracy at WRK. Professor Wolf, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be here. And I should say you're an economist and uh, also the author of numerous books, including Understanding Marxism and your latest Understanding Socialism, which is just brilliant. So, uh, you know, I had somebody called in the show last week and said, uh, when the Fed engages in, in uh, the, participates in the repo market, the, the overnight repurchase market, uh, they're literally throwing into this market billions of dollars or perhaps even fractions of trillions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars. And where does that money come from and does it get repaid and how does it uh, interact with the banks themselves? Does that money in some way add to banks' profitability? Or, or not, and, and you know, what, how does all that work? And then, and then also, uh, you know, I, I, in the Axios newsletter this morning, in fact, they were talking about how the, the Dallas Fed president, Robert Kaplan, yesterday in public remarks said that he felt that the Fed's actions at injecting all this money into the economy, or at least into the banking system, and also at keeping uh, low uh, interest rates, uh, what some would call artificially low, that he's that they're basically goosing the stock market and other asset prices, um, which presumably would mean you know, like gold and oil and things like that. And um, so, and I wanted to talk with you about that too. So let's start out with you know where does where does the Fed's money come from? How does it flow? Who makes money off it? What does it all mean? Okay, <clears throat> the Federal Reserve is the, the peculiar name for the American Central Bank. In other countries, it's called you know, the Bank of England, the Bank of France, and things like that. It's historical why we don't call it the Bank of the U.S., so we changed it because we had some troubles in the 19th century with that bank, and so we called it in 1913 when it got going here over 100 years ago, we called it the Federal Reserve. But the basic responsibility of the Federal Reserve is two things, to control the quantity of money in circulation on the one hand, and to do it in such a way as to, quote, maintain price stability. That is a nice way of saying try to avoid either an inflation when prices zoom up or a deflation when prices zoom down. The Federal Reserve, therefore, is given an incredible amount of power because, in effect, it decides how much money there is. It doesn't do that by itself because in our system we permit private banks to likewise create money by literally uh, saying to a potential borrower of money, the way we'll do it is we will establish an account for you. We will tell you that we, it now has umpteen million dollars in it, and you can begin to spend by writing checks. And that's simply a stroke, a keystroke on a computer that a bank is allowed to do. There are regulations and so on governing it. But in effect, the Federal Reserve either pumps money in by lending money to the banks or by buying from the banks the treasury securities that the banks previously bought from the government. There's a variety of ways of doing it. But the bottom line, because it's not worth getting caught in the weeds, is that the Federal Reserve has the option to increase or decrease the quantity of money in circulation in cooperation with banks. Hmm. What that repo market problem was over the last several months it was a little bit like, and I mean this parallel, with the subprime mortgage crisis back in 2007. It's a scary development. Suddenly, interest rates in this specialized credit market called the repo market spiked up, and the Federal Reserve got scared that rising interest rates would hamper borrowing and thereby undercut the economy. Mr. Trump got even more worried about it because a downdraft in the economy would be deadly for his reelection effort. 
And between those two phenomena, they started pumping money into the repo market. But markets are all linked. If you pump in money in one place, that money can quickly move from one market to another. And this is how we'll answer your second question. It could, of course, happen, and that would be the fantasy of the, of the economists that run our society, that pumping extra money in will lead that money to be put in the hands of individuals who will buy more goods and services, companies that will produce more goods and services, and thereby jobs will go up and the economy will prosper. That didn't happen, and for a simple reason. Over the last 40 years, the purchasing power of this country has been withdrawn from middle income and poor people and concentrated in the hands of the rich. But the rich are a very small minority, and they do not buy in the way that the mass majority of our people would. So there is, in effect, no incentive for that money to go into producing goods and services to be blunt because Americans in the majority cannot afford to buy them. So where does the extra money go? Into the stock market. That becomes the place to use the money. You buy shares. Everybody else is using the new money to buy shares. So the shares go up, which only incentivizes the next batch of new money from the Fed to go into the stock market to cash in. And you've seen it particularly in the last two weeks, but you've seen it before. Extra money produces an inflation, not in the goods and services market, because that's not where the money is going, but in the stock market. Huh. And for the top 5% of the American people, that looks like wealth and riches going up. They're happy. They will donate to the political forces that keep this going. And the rest of us will be spectators on a deepening inequality. Now, there are some countries that have had very low interest rates and, and this kind of uh, intervention by their federal bank for decades. Are there, are there not? Uh, Japan, for example? Absolutely, and they have the highest amount of government debt and private debt in the world. I mean, they're way ahead of the, of the United States. That creates all kinds of difficulties. Look, I mean, the level of debt that is being created, because this money coming in is so cheap with these low interest rates and is so plentiful, that basically what you have said as the monetary authority, and you've said this to the government, you've said it to corporations, and you've even said it to, to working class families. Whatever economic problem you have, here's the solution. Historically unprecedented quantities of money at next to no interest rate. So what we have is an economy which for 10 years now has loaded up on debt in a way we have never seen before, so that the next economic downturn, and we're overdue to have one, is going to be very dangerous because each industry, each company, each uh, government that goes down and can't pay is going to take all the creditors that it has borrowed from down with it. I mean, I noted just a week ago, uh, Tom, that the, the company I grew up with, drinking the milk, Borden, an old company in this country, went bankrupt. And the CEO made a statement in answer to the question, why are you bankrupt? And his answer was, uh, too much debt. Now, he said it as if debt were poured on him by some mysterious force, rather than being something he entered into a contract to acquire. But the bottom line is, any downturn that any company gets, and, and even worse, an economy, will now be ramified by all these debts. Now, a couple of years ago, I read a book about the 20s and 30s, uh, kind of an economic history of the country. And one of the points that they made was that there was massive, widespread debt in New York w around the stock market in the 1920s, that, that people were allowed to buy stocks with a, by, on what, what were called margin buys, where they would put down you know, 5 or 10% of the value of the stock or the price of the stock, and, and, the, and the bank would loan them the money to buy the stock. And that was largely uh, you know, regarded to be one of the things that led to the crash. Is that the same sort of thing that we're seeing right now? You said, you know, these levels of debt are Absolutely. unprecedented. 
Absolutely. We're seeing every kind of debt go crazy. And of course, if the stock markets go up the way they have, for example, in the last couple of weeks, particularly, then it becomes unbelievable what you can do. You can borrow, you put down 10 or 20 percent of the value of a stock, um, and then you, you know, you borrow the rest at a very low interest rate. And if the stock goes up a few percentage points, you sell it, repay the loan, and virtually walk away with a paper profit, which then induces everybody else who's aware of what you're doing to do the same thing. And that's the recipe for spiraling out of control, the way it did in the 1920s and 30s. Lots of the so-called lessons that we were supposed to have learned from the crash, like the one you just mentioned, were then eviscerated in the 30 or 40 years since. And the best example is the Glass-Steagall Act that said we should make a, you know, a, a, an impenetrable wall between commercial banking and investment banking. Uh, they evaded it for 20 years, then they weakened it, and finally, under Bill Clinton, uh, the Congress voted to repeal it, and now we're back in the same mess that we were back then, because we allowed the reforms after the Great Depression to be undone, and now we're facing the consequences. Now, if, if Japan and some European countries have been able to to keep this little Ponzi scheme going for years or for even a generation, why can't we? Because they operate with much more control. They do not permit the private sector, neither the banking sector nor uh, the non-financial, non-banking sector, to operate with the level of freedom from regulation, freedom from accountability, that is the hallmark of the United States, primarily, and of Great Britain secondarily. And so you get, you know, on some cases you get growth spurts because they're not held back by social responsibility. But unfortunately, the other side of that same coin is that they're free to engage in the activity that threatens us all.